Okay. Cool. Hello again, everybody. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the uh, High Renaissance and Mannerism, um, but we're going to talk about them in Northern Europe and Spain. So to give you a little bit of background about what's going on at this point, um, so a big power in Europe up until this point uh, was the Burgundian Netherlands. This dissolves in uh, 1477. So there are some like really big power shifts that happen in the 16th century um, all over Europe. Basically, uh, France and the Holy Roman Empire absorb all of those um, Burgundian territories that previously belonged to the Burgundian Netherlands. Um, and then a little later, through various marriages that are strategically made and through some military conquests, um, by the end of the 16th century, Spain is kind of the superpower in Europe. So they kind of gain a lot of ground during this time period. Also happening right now, there's a lot of uh, religious strife. So uh, we have the um, Reformation happening, the Reformation of the Church. So up until this point, the Catholic Church has been like the church, the only Christian thing happening in Europe, basically, the big um, kind of center of Christendom. So the Reformation comes about and leads to the development of um, Protestantism. So now we have the Catholicism and Protestantism, two different kind of views of Christianity happening. And then the Catholic uh, Church has a response to the Reformation, which is called the Counter-Reformation. So this is causing a lot of people to kind of be moving around in Europe at this time. These conflicts um, and the various military conflicts that, um, because of the redrawing of territories and things, actually increase the exchange of artistic and intellectual ideas because artists are moving around as well. So they're moving around Europe seeking either um, religious freedoms or they're moving to new centers of power where there are new, um, more wealthy courts in place that have money to pay for commissions. So in times of political strife, sometimes artwork production kind of diminishes. This isn't one of those times. It actually sort of increases the production of art. Uh, okay, humanism has also been making its way north from Italy, so we've talked about that a lot in terms of Italy, and it's now um, definitely present in the minds and um, can be seen in the works of artists working in Northern Europe as well. Okay, so the first person we're going to talk about is um, Albert Dürer. So Albert Dürer um, is born in 1471. He's born in Nuremberg, which is um, present-day Germany, but is kind of right in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, he is one of the first artists outside of Italy to become kind of internationally famous. So when we talked about Jan van Eyck and Robert, uh, or excuse me, Roger uh, van der Weeden, Weeden and how famous they were, they were really famous like within their own areas. But Durer is kind of the first northern guy, non-Italian artist, to become known in other areas of Europe as well and to become very sought after. Um, he's also one of the first artists to become extremely wealthy from his work. So this is kind of a new thing. And one of the reasons that he's able to do this um, is because he makes prints that can be reproduced and sold. And he also has a good head for business. His wife has a really good head for business and they both are very good at selling his work. Um, okay, so he's originally uh, trained as a goldsmith. His father was a goldsmith, so he apprenticed with his father and learned that technique, which a lot of people think contributed to his um, gift for engraving, for, for being able to do very tiny, like, technical details um, because he had that background in goldsmithing. Um, he becomes, he's a painter. He starts as a painter. He did a self-portrait when he was... Um, only like 13 that was very realistic so he was very gifted in oil paint um, but what he becomes really famous for are his woodcuts and his engravings so that's kind of how he's known uh, today and was known in his time as well um, so he come, becomes quite wealthy selling his prints uh, he's also the first artist um, which I think this is super interesting because we don't think of this kind of thing happening this early but he is the first artist to file a lawsuit over uh, intellectual property copyright so he saw an image that an Italian artist had made that was a direct ripoff of one of his woodcuts and he sued them and said, you cannot make money off this, this is my property. So he kind of established the early beginnings of copyright law, which is kind of interesting. Um, he traveled a lot, he met lots of artists and intellectuals, he had lots of interesting ideas. 
Um, so he was a very well-regarded individual. Okay, let's look at this particular print of his. Um, this is called The Fall of Man. Parenthetically, sometimes it's it's also called Adam and Eve. So you'll see it, the fall of man, and in parentheses, Adam and Eve. You see it both ways. Sometimes it's just the fall of man. Um, he, he really had an eye for detail, as I mentioned, and he was very good at expressing that in his prints. Um, he was kind of, he was really just like unparalleled in terms of his technical ability at the time. Um, fall of man displays his knowledge of human proportions. He um, was very interested in realistic portrayals of um, the human body, of human anatomy, and also of foliage and animals and things like that. He was um, interested in things looking scientifically accurate. Um, so the poses of Adam and Eve in this print echo poses in classical sculptures of Apollo and Venus. We know that he was familiar with classical sculpture and um, that he traveled extensively to view different um, kind of Greek and Roman classical works. Um, he did a lot of geometric drawings to figure out the composition and the proportions of his figures. So some of his notebooks still exist in some of his sketches, and he spent a lot of time, he didn't go straight into engraving. He would plan these things and really mathematically and geometrically look at the proportions and plan them to make sure that they were um, correct and, and realistic. Um, the textures exhibited in the background are masterful. Um, if you look at the foliage, if you look at the feathers on the bird, if you look at the fur on the animals, um, the animals present are not chosen randomly, they're symbolic. So at this time, um, the temper, temperament and health of, of humans was um, thought to be controlled by the four humors. Okay, so in this paint, in this, not this painting, in this etching, we have uh, the choleric cat, the melancholic elk, the sanguine rabbit, and the phlegmatic ox. So these are animals that represented these different four humors of man. And he had them all here to show that in the garden before the fall of man, everything was balanced. All the humors and temperaments were balanced. And then as you can see in the engraving, Eve is taking the apple from the serpent. So everything kind of falls out of whack and is no longer in balance. So it was a very intentional choice. Okay. This is one of my favorite painters. I actually have um, a poster of this painting in my bathroom. It's at the, this painting's at the National Gallery in London where I studied when I was an undergrad. Um, and it's, I love Lucas Cranach Selder. I think he's wonderful. His paintings are very strangely stylized. So um, Lucas Cranach the Elder, during the Reformation, we kind of need to set up a little information about why he became um, so well known and so successful. Uh, during the Reformation, religions had different ideas about the role of art, basically. So Catholics thought art was useful for worship. It had didactic purposes. It was okay to have portraits of Christ and Mary and the saints and things like this in the church. Protestants thought images of Jesus, Mary, and the saints um, could lead to idolatry, that they, they were bad. It could be construed as idol worship. They also um, thought that they were a distraction, that having images inside the church was distracting from why you were there, which was, you know, to pray and communicate with God. So there was, there was a little disconnect between the role of art in um, Christian religious practices between um, the different entities in the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Martin Luther, who was one of the founders of um, the Reformation and of, of um, you know, Lutheranism, Protestantism, uh, he had a slightly different idea, though. He thought it was okay to include illustrations um, in his translations of the Bible. And in particular, he hired Lucas Cronach the Elder, this artist, to illustrate his Bible for him. They were very good friends. They were the um, godfathers of each other's children. So um, because of that relationship, Lucas Cronach the Elder kind of becomes known as the painter of the Reformation. So he, he becomes kind of the artist that is okay and is acceptable uh, during this time. So he's, he's definitely very much associated with the Reformation and with Martin Luther. Um, okay, so uh, he is born, Lucas is born in 1472. Um, he illustrated Luther's Bible, which I said. Um, he painted a lot of different themes and subjects, so he has a lot of religious paintings. Um, but he also did a lot of um, not uh, just theological paintings, like this one, for example. He did a lot of paintings 
with um, mythological themes. There are often paintings that are trying to tell us something, some kind of um, explanation of virtue. Uh, so this one is um, Cupid complaining to Venus. So as you can see, we have Cupid, we have Venus. Uh, Venus is Cupid's mom, as you might know. And so Venus is the goddess of love. And she's sitting here posing with this tree that has golden apples, which relates to another story about Venus uh, from her mythology. We have a pair of deer in the back, which symbolizes marriage and domesticity. And then we have Cupid, who has this honeycomb with these bees swarming and stinging him. And that's meant to show the sweetness and the hurt and the pain of love. So the duality of love is kind of expressed in this image. Um, with Lucas Cronach the Elder, in all of his subject matter, he tends to place, whether it's a theological, biblical um, painting or it's a mythological painting, he kind of grounds them in uh, a European background. So in his area where they, they would be, um, they would fit in with his clientele who would buy them. Um, we also see here the influence of, of mannerism kind of leaking upward from Italy because we have this very elongated slender kind of body that's not super proportional, it's not super realistic. Um, so it's definitely a, a very uh, northern kind of style, but it is taking some cues from what's happening in Italy as well. Okay, this painting is by uh, Hans Holbein, Hans Holbein the Younger, um, his father was also a painter. Um, so he's a portraitist. He's pretty much just known for doing portraits. He's born in Augsburg, Germany in 1497. Um, he was trained by his father, who as I said was also a, a painter. He produced most of his best known work actually in England, not in Germany or the Holy Roman Empire as it was at the time. Um, he, so he gets invited to go to England because of his skill as a portrait maker. Um, he's invited to go there and be the painter for the court of Henry VIII. Henry VIII is the king of England at this time. Um, so if you look at uh, his body of work, you'll see quite a few paintings of Henry VIII. The details of his work are very exact and sharp, and they sort of like make me think of Jan van Eyck. So he definitely has that northern kind of sharp focus sort of look about his work. He's also... Um, influenced by Italian ideas about composition. We can see this very balanced, very kind of geometric composition here. Everything is, is balanced really well. He trained and became a master painter at the Painting Guild in Basel. Um, he moves to England in 1526 to avoid religious conflict is one of the reasons that he wanted to get out of there. Um, and the first thing he does to kind of endear himself and get himself invited into Henry VIII's court is he goes and he meets Thomas More. Um, if you know anything about history at this time, Thomas More is the chancellor under uh, Henry VIII. So he's the chancellor in England under Henry VIII. Um, basically, Hans finangles an invitation to meet him and then offers to paint his portrait. And it's so good that Thomas More introduces him in court to Henry VIII and he becomes the court painter. And this establishes him as a skilled portrait artist in England. So he has a lot of clientele. Uh, this is one of his most famous works. Um, it's called either the Ambassadors or the French Ambassadors. It's called both, uh, depending on, on whose notation you're looking at. Um, it's because it's of, uh, let me look at their names. I always mess up their last names. Uh, Jean de Dinterville and Georges de Selve are the two figures in the painting. Um, Jean, Jean uh, being on the left, the one with the kind of furry uh, coat. So they are the French ambassadors to England at this time. So they spent a lot of time at the court of Henry VIII, and that's where they had this portrait done. Um, so when we look at this, we see the collection of objects. And like uh, most of the things, most of the paintings we've been looking at, especially in Northern Europe, the objects are all intentional. They're not randomly selected. So these are meant to show their worldliness. They're both very educated. They're both ambassadors and they're both humanists. So they want to be shown as having an interest in the arts um, and, they, and, and education and that kind of thing. So we have, when we look in here, we have some mathematical tools. Um, we have an open hymn book. We have astronomical implements. There's, you know, a couple of globes. There's a lute that has a broken string. 
Um, so they just want it to be shown that they are, they're artsy and knowledgeable and very important men of, of education and knowledge and stature. The best part of this painting, though, is this large gray uh, kind of plank streak at the bottom, which maybe looks like a piece of driftwood or something. So I saw this painting um, when I, it's at uh, the National Gallery in London, and I thought this was the coolest trick I had ever seen. I was like, I think I was about 20 when I was over there, so it's been a long time ago, but it's pretty rad. So there's a technique called uh, anamorphosis, anamorphosis, okay, and that's an image distortion technique in painting. So you're painting from a reference, but to create this kind of image, you use a cylindrical mirror and look at an object in the cylindrical mirror and paint it based on how it looks in the cylindrical mirror. So that's what he's doing here, and it creates an optical illusion. So take a peek at this and see if you can figure out what it is, and I'll go to the next slide. It's a skull. So when you see this thing front on, it just looks like that kind of weird stretched out streak of gray. But when you walk to the side and are basically parallel to the canvas and look at it from the corner of your eye, it forms this perfectly proportioned skull that's in the image label B here. So it's this really cool optical illusion that this artist figured out how to portray. It's pretty neat. The exact purpose of why he put this weird hidden optical illusion skull in here is unknown. Um, I mean, it certainly says something about mortality and is a reminder of mortality and death. Um, there's also a skull on our friend in the picture, Jean's uh, medallion on his hat has a little skull. We have a crucifix in the corner kind of peeking out from the green curtain. So maybe it's to do with morbidity and death, death and then like rebirth through Christ. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of different things like this at this time. Um, you'll notice he also uses oil and tempera both together in this work, which is a trick he um, learned in Basel from Venetian artists who painted in that way. Okay, so that's pretty cool, right? Optical illusion hidden skull from 1533. Pretty neat trick. Okay. Oh, let's talk about this guy. Speaking of interesting optics, um, so... <laughs> This is one of my favorite painters from the period. It kind of seems like he came out of a time machine and was actually supposed to be in the early 20th, early 20th century and part of surrealism. He's a little bit suspended outside his own time. Um, but this is the leading painter in the Netherlands at the turn of the century, and it's uh, Hieronymus Bosch. Okay, so he's born in 1450, he dies in 1516. Um, this is his most famous painting. Uh, you are maybe familiar with it. It's, um, I think, been in a lot of college dorm posters over the years. Uh, it's it's pretty wild. It's it's a little trippy. So this is called The Garden of Earthly Delights. Um, it's because it's a triptych, it sort of looks like it was meant to be an altarpiece for um, a religious area, for a church. That is not the case. It was never displayed in a church. Um, the first place it was publicly displayed, and it was probably commissioned for, though it's not uh, totally certain if, the, if this is true, was the palace of Count uh, Hendrik III of Nassau Breda. So that's where it was displayed for a long time. Um, it's a weird painting. It's an odd painting, right, when you start looking at it, for a lot of reasons. Um, it maybe had some kind of religious function, we're not totally sure. But it was probably a secular commission, um, not it, meaning not commissioned by a church, right? All right. Some people think it was a wedding present, like a wedding gift for this count or for someone in his court because of all the sexual things happening in the center panel. Um, I think that's kind of an odd theory. Um, but in any regard, it's very ahead of its time. It's It's, you know, 400 years before surrealism happened. So this was a guy who had some some foresight and a lot of imagination. All right, so let's break this thing down. In the left panel, um, we have Christ, the figure of Christ, and he uh, is kind of gesturing and presenting to two nude figures, a man and a woman, in a gardenscape. So it's generally thought that this is supposed to be Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and we have Jesus there, um, maybe the idea being that we're showing the fall of man through Adam and Eve, and the redemption of man through Jesus all in the same panel. It's a little bit unclear. Um, as Gardens of Eden go, it's a strange one. We have this kind of pink, weird creature thing that's 
also maybe a fountain. We have a unicorn back there. There's an elephant. There's a very odd looking giraffe. There's some other kind of exotic creatures. There's a fish that has wings. There's, you know, so you've got Garden of Eden, but you've got some sort of exotic, strange, imaginary creatures. Then you hop over to the uh, central panel, and it seems like it's a continuation of the left panel, right? If you look up here, you can see that um, the background matches, everything, the landscape matches up. The color palette is the same. Um, so it seems like it's, it's, we're in the same place. It's maybe supposed to be after Eve bites the apple. Um, there's a lot more figures here. We have um, light-skinned and dark-skinned human figures um, who are uh, frolicking and cavorting in various ways. Some of them are doing handstands and stuff. Um, some of them are kind of coupled off. Uh, it seems joyous. They seem happy. They don't seem like they're in any pain or being tortured or anything. Um, but it's kind of weird. We also have a lot of different fruits or fruit-like shapes and a lot of birds or bird-like things. Both of those generally are um, symbolize fertility. So that's another idea about why it might, might have been a, a marriage present. Um, but it's definitely odd. There's uh, more exotic creatures and there's more bizarre kind of made up creature monsters here. Um, then when we go to the right panel, we're in a totally different landscape. Um, most art historians think that this is meant to represent hell. So we have this dark, um, very dark background. Um, the creatures here are now, some of them are eating people. Um, and people seem to be being punished in line with different sins. So you have the seven deadly sins. So uh, the thought is that the, the guy who um, was guilty of gluttony is the one who's vomiting. We have the miser, the greedy person who now is defecating coins. We have uh, this spider monster thing that seems to be molesting this presumably lustful woman who is also being bitten by frog toad things. So there's a lot of things going on here. Um, it's a little disturbing. It's very strange. Um, but it's also very inventive and kind of awesome. Um, so it's it's a very odd painting and it really would have fit right in in the midst of surrealism, which we'll talk about later in the semester. Uh, another idea about it is that it was a lot to do with the um, symbolism of alchemy. So alchemy is um, this kind of magical science that's popular in the Middle Ages and a lot of very learned people at the time this was painted collected books and things about alchemy and it was a very popular subject matter. So some of the creatures look like things from alchemical texts and some of the creatures look like they're based on some of the um, equipment for alchemy, like the, the chemistry equipment for alchemy. So that's another thought that maybe that is part of the influence here. I'm not sure. I don't think anyone is really sure, but it's very interesting. It's um, kind of lovely and creepy and uh, very inventive. Let's look closer at some of the creatures. So our Bosch monsters were kind of the, the Pokemon of the 16th century. They're these very strange hybrid little weirdos that we see all over. And they're, they're kind of great. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's the Garden of Earthly Delights. Okay, let's talk about some totally different things. This is uh, Katerina Van Hemmissen. This is her self-portrait. She painted this when she was only 20 years old. You can see here that she has painted herself as a painter, as a portrait artist, which is what she was. Um, she has portrayed herself holding a mall stick. That's the long stick that helps you steady your hand. She also has paintbrushes. She has her palette. She's looking directly at the viewer. Um, so she, this is the first known uh, self-portrait by a Northern European woman, which is significant. The also thing, the other thing that's significant about it is it's just um, representative of her career. So she's a portrait artist, she's very popular, and she's particularly pop popular among noble and wealthy women. So she, she's kind of known for doing portraits of uh, women particularly at this time. And it's just kind of nice to see women represented in art history this early. 
uh, speaking of women represented in art history, this is uh, Lavina Tierlink. So she's another very well-regarded portrait artist in Northern Europe at this time. Um, and she uh, is actually hired by Henry VIII of England, the King of England, remember that had hired old Hans to paint the French ambassadors and things. Well, Hans dies, and so he needs a new paint, a new painter at court, and he invites uh, Lavina Tierlink to come in and be that painter. He actually comes up with a new title for her. Henry VIII appoints her as the Royal Paintrix, uh, P-A-I-N-T-R-I-X, in 1546. Uh, this is after Hans Holbein dies. And at the court, there are several um, artists. There's not usually just one artist that is as large of a court as uh, Henry VIII, King of England's court. So all the other artists are male. She's very competitive with them, and she ends up actually being paid more than any of her male counterparts, which is unheard of at that time and is kind of unheard of still. You don't often see um, women artists being paid at higher commissions than men. It's still unusual. So that's pretty cool, because that was back in 1546. Uh, this painting is um, significant because this is uh, Henry VIII's daughter. So Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn have a daughter, Elizabeth I. If you know anything about history, Elizabeth I eventually becomes the Queen of England, and she's one of the most uh, successful queens or any nobility in the history of England. Um, her reign is called the Golden Age of England. Um, there's lots of movies about her. But... Um, this is a portrait of her when she's still a princess. She's quite young. She's probably like 20-ish here. Uh, and Lavina Tierlich did many portraits of Elizabeth I. She also did many portraits of Henry VIII and other people at court. Okay. This artist is uh, another very interesting person of the time. So strangely, the uh, greatest or regarded as the greatest, the high, most highly regarded Spanish painter of the time was not originally from um, Spain. He was not born in Spain. So this is uh, Dominicos Theotokopoulos. Um, he was born on Crete. Crete is, an isle, is a Greek island. Um, and he is known as El Greco for his entire career, basically, which means the Greek. Um, he moved to Italy when he was pretty young. He studied late Byzantine art in Italy um, when he initially moved there. I think he was in the Ravenna area, so there's lots of mosaics and things like this. Then he uh, worked in Titian's studio up in Venice. We looked at Titian last time. So he worked for Titian in his studio. Um, he would have been also exposed to the work of Tintoretto and Veronese. He clearly really liked Tintoretto. Um, the way he uses light and shadow is very reminiscent of Tintoretto more so than Titian. Um, in 1577, he moves to Toledo, Spain. That's where he spends the rest of his life. So he's regarded historically as a Spanish artist, even though he's not originally from Spain. Um, his art is really fascinating. He's another artist who was way ahead of his time. Um, when you look at this composition, when you look at the palette, when you look at the brush strokes, this could easily have been a 20th century painting and it was painted in 1608. Um, so when we look at his color palette, it's not generally true to nature. Um, his figures tend to be somewhat abstracted, um, and elongated. Um, he's not interested in this meticulous detail that is very popular in high Renaissance. So he's a little more aligned with mannerism, but he's kind of a little further afield than most of the Italian mannerists, even as you can see here, he's... Um, using very wide brush strokes. He's an oil painter. He applies the paint a little thicker than uh, some of his peers at the time, and he's definitely very interested in capturing shape in these broad, wide brush strokes and making it more gestural and uh, definitely more abstracted than most people at the time. So he is very interesting and definitely um, was very singular in the time period when he was painting. Okay. That is it for this one.